Sean Pender. I'm the National Freedom for All Ireland Chairman. I'm also now the New Jersey State President. I'm a 30-year member of the AOH, and I'm the, father, the proud son and father, uh, son-in-law of two 50-year-old members of the uh, AOH, my late father John and my father-in-law Jim McLaughlin. So the Hibernians has been something, part of my DNA for a long, long time. Today, I want to give a, a quick overview on the Freedom for All Ireland, and especially the Christmas appeal. So many places we go, people say, why are we still doing that? Where does the money go? So I'm hoping today that after this presentation, you get a better feel for what it is we do, why we do it. And if you have any questions, just hold them to the end, and of course, I'd be glad to, uh, to address them. In the uh, AOH Constitution, of course, it spells out who we are, what we do. We work in our communities. We're proud of our Catholic faith. We protect life. We work towards uh, immigration uh, reform, and we protect uh, our heritage and culture. But also, and very importantly, entrenched in our Constitution, the third tenet of the AOH is to aid and advance, by all the legitimate means, the aspirations and endeavors of the Irish people for complete and absolute independence, promoting peace with justice and unity for all of Ireland. That's where the Freedom for All Ireland, and specifically the Christmas Appeal, is in, in, enshrined in our Constitution. One small word up there, though, and I think it's very important, is for all people. When we talk about a united Ireland, and that's what we, our goal is, it will be a united Ireland for all people, for the green and for the orange, for the Catholic, the Protestant, the Republican, the Nationalist, the Unionist, the Loyalist. When we have a united Ireland, boats are not going to show up in the north and take Protestants off the north of Ireland. It's their home also. But we want to have a united Ireland for all people. The history of the AOH and Freedom for All Ireland, well, it goes back to our earliest days. People like Parnell and Michael Davitt spoke glowingly of the efforts of the AOH in America to work for freedom in Ireland. In 1916, that glorious year when Irish patriots stand up to the Brits at the GPO, we helped with our funds and our efforts. An interesting fact that was given to me from Phil Gallagher in Connecticut was in 1919 at the AOH convention in San Francisco, and Jerry Cole was there too, so he reminded me of it. <laughs> Eamon de Valera spoke to our, our joint uh, convention. In 1956, we took the, the uh, steps to make an actual freedom for all our own committee. In the 60s, we joined with our brothers and sisters in the North as they wanted to get civil rights. The people in the North were very, very much inspired by the civil rights movement in this country and other parts of the world. So we wanted to lend our voices and our funds to help these people. Of course, the British government weren't so apt to give out civil rights. So in the 70s and 80s, during the Troubles, our main job was to support the people in the North who were trying to get civil rights and to also get the truth out as what to happened. Remember, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there was no CNN. There wasn't even cable TV. The Brits were masters at controlling the, the news that came out of the North. And everything that they ever did put down a major IRA uprising. But of course, as we peeled back the onion, we realized that that wasn't the case. So in the 70s and 80s, we worked to make sure the truth was coming out and to see what happened what was happening in, in, the, uh, in the North. In the 1990s, our membership can be very proud. We stood with so many other Irish Americans and made the North of Ireland a, a topic that needed to be addressed by the American government. And the results of that were the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, an agreement that our organization stands 100% behind until the day we have the full implementation. But of course, as we change from 1998, there's a lot of different changes that go on with the social and political landscape in the north of Ireland. So people started asking, well, why do we still need this Christmas appeal? Why do we need freedom for all Ireland? President Boyle uh, appointed a committee, which I was honored to, to uh, uh, serve on, with actually Danny and Jer, Brendan, um, Brendan Moore was on it, and the late, great um, Dave, Burke. Dave Burke from Massachusetts. Sorry, Dave. 
uh, but basically what we did, and the result was, you know what, we realized that until the day the tricolor is raised in Derry and Kerry, our work is not complete. The funds that we raise for the United Ireland and for Christmas Appeal are just as important today as they were in the dark days of the 70s and 80s because our work is not completed. So what we did was we said we need to get out there, we need to re-inspire the people and continue our, our Christmas appeal. So what we did was say these are the organizations that we want to support with our, with our funds. What I've been trying to do in the digest for the last few years is try to highlight the work of a lot of these and that's what we'll do now for the next few minutes. But basically the organizations that we want to help are the longtime Republican groups, former Republican prisoner groups in the north and community support of north, uh, northern towns. We also want to uh, support attempts by Republican prisoners that are stuck in this country to try to fix their uh, immigration status. We also have become very involved with the Irish speaking schools in the north and we do special projects. One being the Bogside Artists, which I know the people in Maryland are very uh, involved with, and also groups like West Belfast uh, Suicide Prevention. Suicide, of course, unfortunately, is a tremendous problem in the North. In the post-conflict years, uh, they said that if the North of Ireland was a, uh, a country and never by itself, it would be one of the largest countries in the world that would have suicide uh, problems. So we try to give funds to that to see if we could help the communities um, prevent this terrible scourge. We also, in the last three, support where I think we get the most value for our money. They're cross-community opportunities, reconciliation efforts, and the truth and justice initiatives. Now, we just don't give your money away, okay? We just don't say, hey, here's a guy in uh, Derry, I know, let's give him a couple hundred. We keep on file an application for all the groups that we give monies to, to make sure A, that they need, and B, to make sure that their goals are aligned with ours. The groups that we started supporting back in the 60s and 70s were these long-term Republican groups, groups like Belfast National Graves, on Kern Kirk, and Green Cross. And what they actually did was they helped the families of those that were interred. Many people in the North in the 60s and 70s and the 80s were picked up and interred with no judge, no jury. Those families were then left to, you know, fend for their own. These groups used to help those. Now, as the graying of these Republicans happens, there's still a need to help some of those people. It's a smaller, much, much smaller percentage of what we, we give, but we do give in honor for all those who, who fought for Irish freedom for so many years. And the people that work on these groups, if you know a lot of the people in the North, they're some of the, the uh, most uh, famous names in Irish Republicanism. People like Liam Shannon, who's also the manager of the uh, Felons Club in West Belfast. Big McFarlane, Big was the OC in uh, Long Kesh during the, uh, during the hunger strike. Uh, Bobby Story, who was another uh, famous Republican, was involved with the Great Escape. And Seamus Kelly, who was a blanket man in Long Kesh. Republican prisoners. The Brits did a great word job in trying to criminalize what these people did. So of course, by criminalizing people who were fighting for their freedom, they called them prisoners. And I tell you, they weren't prisoners. They were freedom fighters. They were political prisoners. Many people know the famous political prisoners. The, the uh, stained glass there is the 10 brave men of 1981. The woman you see up there to the left is the widow of Joe Cahill, who was a iconic Republican uh, figure. But the ground soldier, the ground Republican, was just a regular person who fought for their country. People like we would have been. We may not have been great known names, but they did a lot of great work and they were in prison so many times unjustly. But what's very interesting, and I think jumps out at you, is when you see these prisoners who fought in the streets of Straban, in the streets of Derry, in Belfast, in Armagh, do you know where they are today? They're back in the streets of Straban, Derry, Armagh, and Belfast, putting their community together. It shows the sincerity of the struggle that they were involved in. These people now go back in, and what we try to do is 
for almost the 20 years of existence. The day that we went there, they were embarrassed to say, don't use the restrooms because they have to be fixed. Over 15 years ago, the funds for a new school were approved. But guess what? Unionist politicians would continually block for 15 years the funds to be able to use. Did that stop these people from going to school and learning Irish? No, it didn't. They should be commended for what they, what, they, what they do. The good news is finally, with the Good Friday Agreement and more and more Republicans in office, Sinn Féin is now the education minister in Belfast. The funds have just been released to hopefully build a school that these children should, should uh, deserve. There's also a, a 501c3 in, in the states called Mary's Gift that raises funds specifically for Irish-speaking schools in the north of Ireland. The gentleman who runs this is a friend of mine called Mike Breen. Mary was his grandmother, Mary Clifford, a fluent Irish speaker that Mike will remember as a child growing up. In her honor, he has made uh, this charity. The Irish language today in the north of Ireland is growing like in no time in the last almost 100 years. There are more children, eight years of old or younger, who speak the Irish language now than they have ever done before. And it's because of groups like School New Fusica and Mary's, and Mary's Gift. So this is an organization that we give to, and it's been a very popular organization. As you give to the Christmas Appeal, if there's an a, 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 a agency that appeals to you, you can direct your funds to that agency. We also, just like I mentioned before, certain uh, community groups, the Bogside Artists, that were let notice by our friends in, in Baltimore. Who were the Bogside Artists? Well, they're the artists of the iconic gables, the iconic murals on the gables walls in the Bogside that truthfully tell the story of what happened in the Bogside and Derry and present a hope for the future. Interestingly enough, Derry it has been named the 2013 City of Culture by the United Kingdom. So that's a very prestigious award. They came and they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to light up the town. We're going to light up the Craigvon Bridge. We're going to light up the Derry Walls. We're going to light up the Apprentice Boy Hall. Apprentice Boy Hall, nice work they do. Guess what they didn't want to light up? The artist, the, the mural artist that tells the story. But Irish being Irish, <coughs> Thanks to Bill Pribble for taking this picture. We were honored to be there this year when the Bogside artist said, you know what? You might light, not light it up, but we'll light it up. Now, I don't know if the work was done to code, so stay away from the lights if you're ever over there. It might be a little bit dangerous, but they do, they do a tremendous, tremendous job. And again, we help make that in some sort of more way possible. Reconciliation efforts, we talked about the big three reconciliation efforts, cross community and truth and justice. You have to put the communities together, okay? In many parts, these people have been living apart for generations. So we look for organizations that help to put them together again. One of the greatest ones is the St. Patrick Center in Down Patrick in County Down. If you're ever in that part of the world, stop by. It's absolutely beautiful. It's not too far from the burial ground of St. Patrick, which you see up there on the upper right-hand side. Um, they do great work, and we've supported with funds small things. One year our funds went to buy costumes for a cross-community play, but it helps put the children together. They have a huge education department that reaches out to the communities to bring the children together to teach them to live together. They've been, um, every year, the director, Tim Campbell, is on the steps of St. Patrick Church in New York City with the, with the Cardinal. That's how great this organization is, is recognized. The Holy Cross School of Ardoin, everybody probably remembers what happened back then in 2001. The poor little boys and girls that were assaulted daily on their way to work. To their credit, the brave man you see next to Ned McGinley, uh, Father Adrian Troy, and the parents said, you know what, the legacy of this event will not be hate. There's enough hate that's gone on. The legacy of this is we're gonna try to build a cross community center. There's a derelict building in that area, which means a vacant type of building, and it's right on the, the flashpoint. One side on the Catholic, one side on the Protestant. The vision of Holy Cross is to one day open that up so children from both sides of the community can come in and to 
work and play in the community center. These are the type of groups that we work with. One of our greatest, I think, successes has been the work we've done in the city of Oma. Oma, of course, uh, was seen as one of the worst atrocities of the conflict of the Oma bombing. And the city at that point knew they had to do something to bring the communities together. Two groups that we've helped are the Oma Choir and the Omar Basketball Team. The Omar Basketball Team on the far right hand corner, that's Eamon Daly from Division 39 in Philadelphia. I, I said he was four foot eight last year, week, so I'd say he's about five foot. But here's a five foot white guy who supposedly knows something about basketball, huh? But it's amazing the work that he's done. He's brought people together, people who would never be together are sitting in the stands now cheering for their kids in basketball. They're carpooling with different people in their car. It doesn't sound like anything, but all of a sudden, when you have children of different communities playing basketball, and now their parents are talking about carpooling, it's little steps like that. Over the last few years, uh, Philadelphia took charge of this. They were the ones very quietly bought basketballs, uniforms. The national board got involved. We put the scoreboard in there. And then last year, everybody got involved, and the team came out to New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. The choir is a world-class choir that some of you might have seen in festivals throughout the, uh, the, the U.S. They sang with the likes of Eileen Ivers and, and others. But what was amazing, when we went back there last year, the choir and the basketball team rented out the top floor of a uh, restaurant and hosted us. We were like conquering heroes again. These are the people that are doing the, the, the hard lifting. We're just writing checks. But when we were over there, the way that we were received by not only the kids, the parents, and people like the mayor of Oma, it really tells you, wow, we're, we're making a difference here. We've also reached out to the other side. This, quite frankly, has been somewhat controversial to some people. But David Irvine Foundation in South Belfast, David Irvine was a loyalist paramilitary. He would be the person to be fighting the IRA. He was a loyalist bomber. When David Irvine went into Long Cash, he started to think. He started to think like many of the Republican prisoners did. You know what, this is not working. He came back, he came out a changed man. Seamus <laughs> Boyle worked with David Irvine on the Jenny Johnson project. project. David Irvine got the Protestant carpenters from the north to work with Catholic carpenters to make the, Dave, to, to make the Jenny Johnson uh, the success that it was. So we've given over the years small donations to the foundation for a specific program. And that program is, it, it targets uh, young teenage boys, 13 to 16 year old that are having problems in school have special after-school programs to try to get them through, to get them their certificate, to make sure they're not on the street throwing rocks and doing antisocial type of behavior. When you go in and you talk to a congressman or a senator, and we talk about what we do, and then we also say we support the David Irvine Foundation, they know that we're true brokers of peace. We want this for everyone. So while it might have been controversial, the small funds that we've given to the, the Irvine Foundation, I think, have really elevated our status throughout uh, the, the uh, Irish government and the American government. Now, why is this all important? I don't know if you know this young man's picture back here. This was Ronan Kerr. Ronan Kerr was 24 years old, Irish Catholic, GAA player. He joined the PSNI, wanted to be a policeman. Type of people we need on the streets of, in the north of Ireland. In Ireland, in the north, they have Mother's Day in April. Ronan was leaving his mother's house on Mother's Day's Eve, got into his car, and was blown up and killed. Because certain people don't want to have Catholics, and they're Catholics who, who did this. The so-called, quote-unquote, dissidents. We can't stand for this. The groups that we supported before are the, gonna make these things not happen. We have to stand to make sure that we will not stand for dissident Republican behavior that includes any type of violence, and we have to support people like Roman Kerr and his family. We can only help hope that in the 
spread out our funds as much as possible so that we have a, a presence throughout the north. Groups like Kostya, which is listed on the bottom, is basically the overall umbrella group for, for uh, ex-prisoners. What Kostya basically does is often fights injustice for all Republican prisoners. Because if you were picked up in 1981 because your brother was a suspected IRA gunman and you were put in jail, you would have a record. 30 years later, you want to get a job, you want to get a house, if you want to adopt a child, that might hurt you. So Kostya oftentimes fights legally a lot of the injustice that still happen for those that were involved in the struggle for Irish freedom. The other groups, groups like Tarnell in West Belfast, Karja in Stravan, and Kivna in South Armagh are the people who fought and have gone back into their communities to help build up their communities. Straban in Tyrone was the most economically depressed region of any, of any country in Europe during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. No surprise that it's about 95% Catholic and strong, strong Republican. But these guys and girls here in Straban, a few years ago, we gave them $2,000. And it got them thinking, wow, if we can get some funds from the Ibernians, maybe there's other places. So they've widened their outreach and have gone to the European Union and now have been able to put together a great community center and this land that you see up here. It was basically wasteland and what they've converted it into is GAA fields um, and community, a community garden. They gave us the honor of planting the first tree in honor of the hunger strikers earlier this year. Two thousand dollars and they consider us the cornerstone of why they're able to do what they are. We went to, to Straban and you thought we were like visiting visiting royalty. We also worry about the prisoners that are stuck here in this country. There's a smaller group of probably around 30, 30 men that if they were in the North during the Good Friday Agreement, their records would have been uh, released and they would have been released from prisons. The men that were over here for various reasons are stuck in that gray area. Now as they're getting older and their families are being lost in the North of Ireland, they can't travel over. Well, I shouldn't say that. They can travel over, but they might not to get, get back in. There's a gentleman by the name of Matt Morrison. Matt's about 55, 56 years old, based in St. Louis. Matt is an emergency pediatric nurse. He's been doing that for 20 years. Matt has saved the lives of American children. Matt has had to spend hours with people who've lost their children. Matt trains the St. Louis the Police Department on how to deal with prisoners who might have mental issues. Our country says Matt Morrison really shouldn't be here. It's time to stop that. Ballyhue McAllister is up there, you see. His case is probably one of the most prominent, a good friend of mine. His daughter, Nicola, is going to school to be a nurse. Her mom died seven years ago from cancer, was diagnosed in April and passed away in late July. She wants to dedicate her life to become a, an oncologist nurse in her mom's uh, memory. Because her status, she doesn't have any status. They can't get loans. Now we all know college education is what they cost, and many people do the same, but every year Maliki has to make sure he has enough money out of his pocket to pay for that tuition and not have the ability to at least get a loan for relief. That's wrong, we need to fix that, and we're working with both the McAllister Group and Harsalia to end these uh, discrimination. The Irish language schools, the picture behind me is probably one of the greatest visits I've had in the north of Ireland in the many times I've gone. It's called School of Fusica. It's in West Belfast and actually Twinbrook, the home of Bobby Sands. Uh, two or three years ago, after Dave Burke passed away, we had raffles, and all the money we raised, we gave to this school. Dave was very instrumental when over 20 years ago when this school first started. The raffle raised over $5,000 and again we went in with the check and we were like conquering heroes. The children put on a Christmas carol in Irish language, they sang songs for us and it was one of the most moving and gratifying experiences we have ever, ever had. I think it's important to note that this school uh, existed 
in FEMA type trailers. The aftermath of his death seems like this, where the GAA and PSNI formed an honor guard for his burial or something that would bring the communities together. We talk about truth and justice. In the North, there is so much that still has to be addressed. The woman that you see up there is Clara Riley. She will be at the National President's Dinner in October to win, uh, to receive the, Shane, um, the Sean McBride Humanitarian Award. She spent 45 years of her life with human rights work in the North of Ireland. I hope you all get the opportunity to meet with her. But what do these groups do? They try to take the injustice of the past, people who have been killed. We all know the big, bigger names, the Pat Vanuken, the Bloody Sunday, but there's so many other people. One is the Bally Murphy families. What happened in Bally Murphy? Seven months before Bloody Sunday, the same troops were in West Belfast. They killed 11 people, including the mother of eight. Of eight. Over 50 children lost a parent on that day. What did the British do? They said they put down a major IRA uprising. The same troops, seven months later, went to Derry and killed 13 people. That's justice for you. These people deserve justice as much as the people of Derry do. The Pat Finucane Center does tremendous work, named after the, the human rights murderer who was killed, the human rights lawyer who was killed by the loyalist in collusion with the British security forces. They've helped people for over 30 years, and they're probably one of our largest donors that we give money, money to. We've also worked with groups called like Truth and Justice for the Dublin Monaghan bombing. 34 people were killed in 1974. The British, as, soon, uh, as recently as two months ago, have said we will not release any more files related to this case, even though they have them. <clears throat> There's so many people that are nameless to us and are just known to their families. This is the Remembrance Wall in Beachmont Street in West Belfast. There's about 25 of these, and on each one of them you can put about 30. So do the math. And you know what? They got another 25 they want to put up. All of those people deserve justice in some way. And they're not looking for retribution, they want just truth. They want the dirty little secret of what happened in the North to be, to be told. And groups like Pat Finucane Center, Relatives for Justice, and others are trying to make that happen. Now, we have been instrumental in shining the light of truth on a lot of these. In 2007, we brought Relatives for Justice over. We were the first ones ever to bring in Protestants and Catholics who were affected by British security agents in collusion. And they had their time in DC to tell their story. And it's very gratifying to realize that three of the five people have got justice because of what we've done. The likes of Raymond McCord, Paul McElwain, and Geraldine Slaney. The British have come out and admitted finally to what they've done. And of course, we were all so happy on June 15th of last year when the innocent people in Derry were vindicated finally and the world knew, in the, in the words of David Cameron, that the acts that day were unjustified and unjustifiable. And I can't tell you how happy the Bloody Sunday family people were that day and how appreciative they've been of us to show up every, every year. And we've also given donations over the year to help with expenses, especially related to traveling. <clears throat> in closing our, our Christmas appeal, our efforts has made us well respected. When we walk in, especially on the groups that we go with, we are welcome. We've been in city halls in Derry and Belfast and Armagh. We have a great relationship with the uh, AOH in the, the north and we have access to the decision makers in the north. On the right hand side there you'll see myself and Danny O'Connell meeting actually with the, uh, the uh, policing board. But again, because of our good works and because of our stance, we have access to that. And if I look a little different, it's only because if you get a picture like that on PowerPoint, yeah. if you stretch it, you can lose about 15, 20 pounds. So I really, I mean, that's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> I just want to give a recap of what we've done. Over the last 10 years, the, the Christmas Appeal has raised over $570,000, which is a great number. But the one thing I want to hammer home here today is how critical these funds are. We do great work as the men and women of, of, of Hibernians in this country. We support locally Catholic charities, veteran charities, hunger relief, and so many others. But it's important to realize that our funds, when we give to organizations like that, 
or matched or met with the other people in our community. These funds are. So the funds that we give to Relatives for Justice, from Pat Finucane Center, to the OMA uh, basketball team, there isn't that wider community that's going to give it to that. So all I'm asking you this time is to think as you go back to your, your boards and your divisions to give a donation this year to the Christmas Appeal, however small it might be. Because if we take a look at what we raised last year, $61,000, a great job. But there were 25 donations of over $1,000. So 65% of the $61,000 was given by 25 people. So we have a, a, a staunch group of people who give each and every year that make it so successful. Where we need to improve is the smaller donations. Last year we had 157 donations that made up about 32%. But when you take a look from the men's side, we have 370 nation, uh, divisions nationwide, 96 contributed. Only one in four have given funds. So, and I'm sorry I don't, I don't have the breakout for the ladies, but I'm sure it's, it's, it's the same. So if, you're one, if your division or board is one of the one in four that gave, I thank you so much for all the people that we support in the North Island and all the communities. If you're not, I would ask that you sincerely go back and to think to give 25, 50, 100 dollars this year to the uh, to the uh, to the Christmas appeal. In closing, we take a look at Maryland from the last.